Today, there are two million descendants of French Canadian immigrants living in New England. These are our stories. Welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Venez tous jeunes filles et garçons, je vais vous raconter l'histoire de notre immigration ici au USA, de grands aventuriers de pays étrangers. Bonjour everyone, this is Melody with French Canadian News. It's finally summertime and we have lots of great events coming up. But first, let's start with some articles. We'll start with the latest blog post from Career of the Past by Patrick Lacroix titled QTP at 150, back to Dingalong Street. Check out Dr. Lacroix's reflections on his inspirations and work as a historian in the transnational French-Canadian community. Next up, there's a new blog post by Juliana LaRue titled Learning Culture from Modern Francos. Check out Juliana's post that draws inspiration from my latest post titled Is It Too Late? Establishing New Symbols of Franco-America. Learn about new symbols that we could use to tell the Franco-American story. Which symbols would you use for your family's Franco-American story? And now on to events. On May 26 at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time, check out a reading and author talk with Ron Curry Jr., hosted by the USM Franco-American Collection. Ron Curry Jr. is a novelist, screenwriter, and native Mainer. His work has been translated into 15 languages, and he has won numerous prestigious awards for his writing. Curie will be reading from a new, as yet unpublished novel set in the Franco-American community in Waterville. Be the first to learn about his new novel. A Q&A will follow the reading. On June 3rd from 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern, check out Robert Sylvain and Friends playing from Meme's Notebook at the Saco River Theater in Bar Mills, Maine. Get your tickets today for this musical performance, featuring songs that Robert Sylvain modernized from his Meme's book of traditional Acadian folk songs. On June 6th at 6 p.m. Eastern, check out Le Grand Jack, Jack Kerouac's road documentary screening and Q&A. The Franco-American Collection at the University of Southern Maine will be having an in-person event screening of the documentary Le Grand Jack, Jack Kerouac's Road, a Franco-American Odyssey. Following the screening, there will be a Q&A period with the filmmaker, Hermene Gilles Chiasso. If you're not in the Southern Maine area for the screening of the movie, here are other places you can attend the film screening and the Q&A with the filmmaker. On June 7th from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern, check out Le Grand Jack Movie Night with the Manchester Franco-American Center. The movie screening will take place in the Dana Center, room 1D, at St. Anselm's College. On June 9th from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Eastern, check out Le Grand Jack Movie Night at the Museum of Working Culture. Tickets are $10 each. We hope that you can catch the film at at least one of these locations. On June 7th from 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Eastern, check out Pret de Parlay in person with the Franco-American Center at the Dana Center Lecture Room on St. Anselm's College. From June 16th to the 26th, this is your reminder to get tickets to Abby Page's latest one-woman performance, Les Filles du Quoi, at Lost Nation Theatre in Montpelier, Vermont. That's all I've got for you this time. Everything I've covered today will be linked in the French Canadian Legacy podcast episode description. Merci for listening. Welcome to the first, and hopefully not the last, installment of the Lacroix Library. I want to thank Jesse, Mike, and Melody for the invitation and the opportunity to talk about books. So let's dive right in. Front and center this week is the French Canadians of Michigan. Their contribution to the development of the Saginaw Valley and the Keweenaw Peninsula, 1840 to 1914, by Jean Lamar. Lamar is a professor of history at the Royal Military College of Canada in Kingston, Ontario, and he is a graduate of the Université de Montréal. He has studied Quebec history and has published a book on the French Canadians who served in the U.S. Civil War. The French Canadians of Michigan is a stellar work that provides valuable context on the Quebec exodus as a whole and looks at a little-known facet of the diaspora. As Lamont reminds us at the outset, one out of every four French Canadians living in the U.S. in 1890 was located outside the Northeast. Michigan and its neighboring states have been somewhat neglected. What do we know and what can we know about the Quebec expatriates who were involved in the logging and mining sectors of northern Michigan? Lamar aims to find out with this book. The first chapter is a solid synopsis of the situation in Quebec and the push and pull forces that made Michigan an alluring destination long before the auto industry took off. Though French Canadians were in the Saginaw Valley in fur trading days, the region really grew in importance as America's timber frontier moved westward. In 1840, New York and Maine were the top timber producers in the U.S. Michigan was number one by 1870. Mining, specifically copper mining, played a more important economic role in the Keweenaw region. 
As we learn about these separate regions, we get a sense of the migrants' economic fortunes. Though hardships were many, the population grew steadily. The Saginaw Valley boasted a French-Canadian population of 10,000 in 1900. We see people trying to reproduce the way of life they had left. We also see a campaign for separate churches or separate parishes, familiar to those of us who live in New England. Four French newspapers would in fact pop up in Bay City. This region also became a secondary migration field as people moved from Quebec to New England first, and then to Michigan. At last, Lamar explores the relative decline of the population in the early 20th century due to economic woes and the emergence of acrimonious social tensions. So why should you pick up this book? Well, for one thing, it complicates our view of French Canadians as a transnational people who moved in large numbers to parts of the continent that weren't contiguous with Quebec. We also see the migrants engaging in some of the economic activities they had known back home. Now, don't worry. This is a very accessible and very much worthwhile book. For those of you who are more comfortable reading in French or who might be refining your French, guess what? There is a French version that appeared at Septentrion in 2000. This is one of very few books on Franco-Americans that has appeared in both of these languages. You can find it still today in the catalogs of Septentrion and the English language publisher, Wayne State University Press. So pick it up. Bonne lecture. Hey, thanks, Patrick and Melody. Now, next week's guest is somebody that we have had on the podcast before, albeit quite some time ago, all the way back in our seventh episode. So one of the earliest people we've had the opportunity to talk to, Abby Page, super talented person, incredibly funny performer, playwright, actress, poet. She has done stand-up comedy. She's done sketch comedy. Just an amazing person, super funny, super interesting person to listen to. She now has a second show coming up. So we wanted the opportunity to speak with her again. Her show is called Fille de Quoi, and that's going to be from June 16th through the 26th, 2022. It's going to be performed live in Montpelier, Vermont, but you'll be actually be able to live stream it or even catch it on demand afterwards. So we had the opportunity to talk with her about some of the projects that she's been working on. And of course, this new uh, one woman performance, which is just, we've Mike and I saw a version of it back in Resubly Mall in 2019. So it's an amazing, amazing show. Highly recommend. So very excited to be able to speak with her again again next week. Abby Page, Le Fille du Quoi. Okay, cool. Now, bonus question time. We got to talk oh, about bonus questions. Bonus questions. Yeah, I know. Everybody gets nervous now about the bonus question. <laughs> Bon Yeah, bonus shouldn't sound scary, right? I know. <laughs> it's I, not I, a bonus question. It's funny. No, but just in general, because you, you bring a, definitely a different perspective then, you know, most of the people here, you know, from Vermont and then kind of moved back to Quebec. So I'm wondering what, how, what was your COVID experience like having to now be on the other side of that border? Because uh, I've obviously we've talked to a lot of people from this side, but how was it now having grown up here and having to spend that COVID time up there? Yeah, I didn't leave Canada for two years, almost you know, I gotta say, uh, it was pretty, I mean, I missed my family. I was worried about my family. Sure. I wanted to be able to get to them. And that was difficult to feel like, I mean, I, I really could have, I'm a dual citizen, so I could have crossed if I needed to. It's just a matter of the safety of it. But man, Canada handled it so well. Like the, we were really, really, really tightly locked down, yeah. especially in the Maritimes. Like we couldn't even go to Quebec. Oh, wow. Um, and um, so we were really locked into New Brunswick, but we, the first year <laughs> was, we like really lived, I mean, not the first couple months, the first couple months when it was like, we don't know how you get it Sure, <laughs> it was really sure. like yeah. we were locked in. But then once we were let out in like May or June, end of May, early June, 2020, we lived a pretty normal existence for the following year. Because Which we were the, not here, yeah. No, and because the numbers were so low because they were so conservative about what letting people in and out. So it was hard because we were trapped, but we were tr we were trapped in like a really safe little bubble. It was like the safest place to be in North America. So I really admired the way that the Canadian system worked, even though it was really weird to be... Um, and you know, when I, when I moved to Canada, this is a really disjointed answer. I'm sorry. No, this is perfect for the bonus um, question. 
when I moved to Canada, I was really, I would talk to people about like, I don't know, that border, like, it just makes me uncomfortable to have a border between my family and me. And people were like, oh, that, you know, that border, like, because when I was a kid, right, you didn't even need a passport to, right. to cross. So like, people were like, oh, no, don't worry about that border. And when it closed, I felt a little bit like, see, yeah, see, that yeah. border is real. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. It became real for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm so glad that it's open again, but it feels much more touchy about like what, you know, what, what's the next thing that could happen where we could be cut off again. Did you guys have the, uh, the passports? Did you guys have to do that in New Brunswick, the COVID passports? No. Okay. I know we definitely, had, we, had, we had that in Quebec when I, when I was yeah. there. Yeah. Well, you, cause you went to Quebec last summer? Last year. Yeah. April through yeah. October. Yeah. So we didn't get we didn't get um vaccinated until june may okay so may or june so by the by the time i got i got my shot like two days before i came back to the u.s so it was too early for me to get a passport yeah essentially. there you go so um but yeah. yeah. So I think it is instituted now, but but the it, vaccination it, 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 yeah. rolled out a lot later there. So it was just or, it, it, or they prioritized. They just prioritized people differently. People in my age group were not prioritized, so got our shots pretty late. Gotcha. Yeah. It was it was weird. I mean, I would never left the house without my card proving, you know, that I've had yeah. my vaccines. And I just remember when I came back, the very first gas station I stopped in in Vermont. When I walk inside, I'm the only one with the mask on. And I thought I was in Bizarro World because you couldn't go in any building ever under any circumstance right. in Quebec without a mask. And now now I'm the strange one walking in with a mask. It's very, very, very different now. Yeah, I can't even imagine being... I mean, COVID's tough enough for everybody. But when you're on the other side of a board of the family here, I can imagine that's really no good. Yeah, there were definitely times in the early days when I was like, so if somebody gets sick there, like, do I leave you, like with my husband and son, do I leave my husband and son on this side of the border to go be with my family on that side of the border and then possibly not be able to get back? Or, I mean, I probably would have been able to get back, but then it was like, you know, was yeah. really, I, I don't know what people did who were even further away, you know, people who were like overseas from others. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I mean, we had some kind of crazy stories from, even like Northern Maine, like I guess some of those regions, it's almost like it was one giant community just happened right. to be on both sides of the border. Then all of a sudden COVID happens. And we talked to one woman who now was isolated from both her parents and her kids because they now found themselves on the other side. Just, right. just again, just like kind of how you had said, stuff you would never, ever think of before. That Yeah, those border communities like Madawaska and well, and there are a lot of communities like that in Northern Vermont that used to be like, you know, there's one there's one fire department for both sides of the border. Wow. So like what do you do when you <laughs> close the border? Right. You know. Now our fathers look at us and sigh with despair to think that everything they love we simply do not share. But the spirit never dies, our culture will survive. Each of us must choose how much to keep alive. Each of us must choose how much to keep alive. Special thanks to Josie Vashon for providing the music. You can find more about her at josievashon.com. This podcast was produced and edited by Mike Campbell. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at fclpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at fclpodcast for more information about the topics discussed. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this episode.